Hello, and welcome to History 300, The Origins of the First World War. Lecture 10, The Moroccan and Bosnian Crises, 1905-1911. In this and the following lecture, we're going to begin looking at the specific events which led up to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914. As I've mentioned before, the crisis that erupted that year was far from being the first time that the European great powers had been close to war since the beginning of the 20th century. Diplomatic crises were actually quite common. Between 1905 and 1911, three in particular took Europe quite close to a major conflict. The first Moroccan crisis of 1905, sometimes known as the Algeciras or the Tangier crisis. The Bosnian crisis of 1908, and the second Moroccan crisis of 1911, also known as the Agadir crisis. In all three cases, the specific cause of the crisis was actually much more substantive than that of the death of some Austrian aristocrat. But war did not break out in 1905, nor in 1908, nor in 1911. These three crises, then, are interesting both for what did happen during them, but also for what did not happen as a result of them. Why was it that peace held in each case when it could not hold in 1914? Why did these crises work out differently than the July crisis? Two of the three crises involved Morocco. Morocco was unusual by 1905 because it was one of the few parts of Africa which still remained out of the formal or informal control of a European power. Morocco's independence was something that France, however, sought to bring to an end. The French knew that they could not simply send a military expeditionary force to Morocco to overthrow the Sultan. The other great powers, jealous of any attempt by their rivals to alter the status quo in Africa, would not have tolerated it. So the French would have to secure the acquiescence of at least some of their neighbours if they were to move ahead with their plans. The most important potential obstacle was Britain. The British, like the French, had extensive commercial interests in Morocco and they were likely to oppose any unilateral attempt by the French to establish a colonial protectorate there. But in 1904, the British, seeking to improve relations with the French, given the rising tension between themselves and Germany, agreed to discuss a compromise. Back in 1882, Britain had established effective control over Egypt, something that had created enormous resentment in France, which had previously regarded itself as Egypt's main European patron. The agreement drawn up in 1904, this is the famous Entente Cordiale we are talking about, proposed that if the French agreed to drop their objections to British control of Egypt, the British would not stand in the way of French moves against Morocco. The road seemed to be clear for a French takeover then. But the Germans were watching events closely, and they decided to throw a wrench into the works the following year. In March 1905, Kaiser Wilhelm II who was on a cruise through the Mediterranean, landed in Tangier, Morocco's northernmost port, close to the Straits of Gibraltar, and made a public speech at the German legation, in which he declared that the Sultan of Morocco was the ruler of a free and independent country that ought to remain subject to no foreign control. He also declared that he expected Germany to have advantages in trade and commerce with Morocco equal to those of all other countries. Wilhelm took on this mission somewhat reluctantly at the bequest of his Chancellor, Prince von Bülow. He was afraid for his personal safety while in Morocco, and he also resented the fact that he was being used essentially as a puppet in a diplomatic game. But the speech had the desired effect. The French press, which had come to assume that a French takeover of Morocco was a foregone conclusion, regarded Wilhelm's intervention as a major provocation. Von Bülow was not especially interested in Morocco as such. The aim of his meddling was to test the new relationship between France and Britain. The ink was still dry on the Entente Cordiale in spring 1905, and to the Germans there seemed to be something unnatural about this new understanding between two bitter historical rivals. Bülow hoped that by stirring up trouble over Morocco, he could uncouple the British from the French. In fact, however, it had quite the opposite effect. Britain made it clear that it too regarded Wilhelm's remarks as unnecessarily provocative, and the government in London assured Paris that it would back France up. 
The British were worried that Germany might be trying to negotiate a lease on a naval base on Morocco's Atlantic coast, which would have represented a major threat to the British control of the Straits of Gibraltar. For some weeks, the language in the press in France and Germany became so heated that it seemed as though a repeat of the War of 1870 might actually break out. The French cancelled all military leave and appeared ready to mobilize. Germany called up some of its reservists to the army. French and German troops were moved to the border. In the end, however, the crisis was settled by diplomacy. The Sultan of Morocco appealed for an international conference to settle his country's status, and this was agreed to by all the great powers. The conference met in Algeciras in southern Spain from January to April 1906. The German delegates arrived hoping that they would be able to form a coalition of diplomats to block French primacy in Morocco. But instead, to their embarrassment, they discovered that it was they who were outnumbered. France had secured the backing not only of Britain and Russia, but also of Spain, the United States, and even Germany's ally, Italy. Only Austria-Hungary supported the Germans, and only half-heartedly. The outcome of the conference, the Treaty of Algeciras, basically confirmed that the French, and to a lesser degree the Spanish, had unique rights in Morocco over all the other great powers. Although the Germans were able to insert a face-saving clause that guaranteed formal Moroccan independence. Overall, the Germans came out of the Algeciras crisis embarrassed. They had gained nothing for their efforts except to make the Franco-British partnership stronger than ever before. Wilhelm, in particular, felt personally humiliated, and he emerged from Algeciras with far less trust for the civilian politicians of his government. He was more determined than ever to look for military rather than diplomatic solutions to Germany's problems. We move now to 1908, and to events at the other end of Europe, in the Balkans. The starting point for what became known as the Bosnian Crisis of that year was the so-called Young Turk Revolution, which broke out in April 1908, when a group of modernising army officers demanded changes to the Ottoman Empire's constitution. The chaos this temporarily brought to Turkish politics opened up an opportunity for two of the Ottoman Empire's old rivals, Russia and Austria-Hungary. Russia had long sought the right to be able to move its battleships bottled up in the Black Sea through the narrow straits of Constantinople to the Mediterranean. Austria-Hungary, for its part, had militarily occupied the Ottoman provinces of Bosnia and Herzegovina since 1878, but it did not formally own the territory. Annexing Bosnia-Herzegovina outright would be a slap in the face to Austria's fierce rival in the Balkans, the Serbs. The reason that the two great powers had not acted on their ambitions before was that first, they knew that the Ottomans themselves would protest fiercely, and that second, they expected resistance from each other. But in July 1908, Russian Foreign Minister Alexander Izvolsky wrote to Austro-Hungarian Foreign Minister Alwa Erenthal and proposed that the two great powers take mutual advantage of the disorder going on in Turkey. If Austria-Hungary would acquiesce in a demand to open up the Straits of Constantinople to all Russian naval vessels, the Russians would raise no objection if Austria-Hungary annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina. The two diplomats met secretly in September to thrash out the details. All seemed to have been agreed. But then the Austrians stabbed the Russians in the back. Izvolsky wanted both powers to pause for a little while before taking action against the Ottomans. He knew that an Austrian takeover of Bosnia-Herzegovina would infuriate Russia's ally, the Serbs, and also be highly unpopular in Russia itself. And so he wanted to prepare his government's response carefully. He also wanted to make sure that Russia's ally, France, was willing to support the agreement. But the Austrians were uncharacteristically bold. On October the 6th, Far earlier than Izvolsky had ever expected, Emperor Franz Josef announced that Austria was annexing Bosnia-Herzegovina. Serbia immediately mobilized its army, threatened war, and appealed to Russia for help. Not daring to admit that he had been secretly complicit in the plan all along, Izvolsky had no choice but to back up Serbia or risk losing Russia's major Balkan ally. But the Germans immediately countered. Kaiser Wilhelm was privately furious with the Austrians for their reckless decision to annex Bosnia-Herzegovina, but he and his government felt that with Austria their only major ally, they had no choice but to protect Vienna from the Russians. Berlin made it clear, then, that any military action against Austria would be met with war. 
France, having been caught by surprise by the whole affair, offered only limited support to Russia. Plus, the Russian army was in no state for war in 1908. Russia had recently lost a major conflict with the Japanese in East Asia and had also gone through a revolution at home. The Russian government had no choice but to capitulate. Without Russian support, Serbia could do nothing but fume. An international conference was summoned which basically agreed to the Austro-Hungarian annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Russia was unable to advance its claim to free naval passage through the Straits of Constantinople and was left, essentially, with nothing. The humiliated Izvolsky was packed off to Paris as ambassador in some disgrace. We move finally now back to Morocco. In spring 1911, a rebellion by indigenous tribesmen broke out against the Moroccan sultan. This was just the kind of pretext the French had always wanted to secure control of the country once and for all. They sent in 20,000 troops, ostensibly to restore law and order and to protect European lives and property, but really with no intention of ever removing themselves again. The Germans were incensed, seeing this as an abrogation of the guarantee of Morocco's independence that they had managed to insert into the Treaty of Algeciras five years earlier. They wanted to secure compensation for France's action. So on July the 1st, 1911, the German gunboat Panther made anchor off the southern Moroccan port of Agadir, ostensibly in order to protect German nationals in the area. This was not a very convincing explanation for the Panthers' arrival, as in fact there wasn't a single German citizen in Agadir at the time. The real purpose of the mission, which had been instigated by the German Foreign Secretary without seeking approval of his colleagues or the Emperor, was to force colonial concessions from the French. The Germans would only withdraw from southern Morocco if France awarded them considerable territorial gains in West Africa as a penalty for its breaking the 1906 treaty. As in the Algeciras crisis, the German action provoked uproar in France. Once again, the British feared that the Germans would try to win for themselves an Atlantic naval base. The Royal Navy dispatched warships to the area in case war broke out between France and Germany. The British government had not been pleased at the decision by France to send troops to Morocco, but the German response forced it to take sides. Reluctantly, but firmly, it sided with its French partner. Russia, still smarting from its humiliation over the Bosnian crisis three years earlier, also backed France. The Germans found once more that they were virtually alone. Indeed, the Austro-Hungarians, showing a remarkable lack of gratitude considering the support that they had just received over Bosnia, refused to offer even diplomatic support to their allies in Berlin, insisting that African affairs were really none of their business. The German stock market crashed. Once again, the Germans were compelled to back down. A convention known as the Treaty of Fez was negotiated, in which Germany accepted a French protectorate over Morocco, in return for which it received some very minor territorial concessions in what is now Cameroon. This was a poor return on its original ambitious demands. So what do these three crises tell us? Well, they tell us for one thing, that in order for a crisis not to turn into a war, someone has to be willing to give in. In each of these cases, one of the great powers decided, in the end, that it simply wasn't in its best interest to go to war at that particular moment over that particular issue. In 1905, Germany backed down. In 1908, Russia backed down. In 1911, Germany again backed down. But there were indications that this willingness to step back from the brink wouldn't go on forever. The Germans believed that they had learned from their humiliations over Morocco that France, Britain and Russia were conspiring to encircle them and to deny them the world influence that they rightly deserved. The Kaiser in particular became disillusioned by politics. After 1905, and even more so after 1911, he looked to his generals rather than his statesmen for advice. The Russians, for their part, felt that if they ever acquiesced to the Austro-Hungarians in the Balkans again, then they would lose the patronage of Serbia forever. So while the crises of 1905, 1908 and 1911 all ended peacefully, they also made the conditions for further peace more difficult the powers that had backed down would be less likely to back down again if another crisis emerged. Okay, in the next lecture, we'll look at the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, 
the conflicts that immediately preceded the plot to assassinate Archduke Franz Ferdinand. See you then.